robot up and running. A rookie team probably just needs to get the robot on the road, road and, and running around. So, so we did nomadics. Now it's getting to the kind of important stuff. We're going to start talking to you guys about how you, how the control systems work, a little bit about the history of the control systems, and uh, how to wire them up, and some of the tools and tips and tricks from some of the other teams uh, to help you get going. Uh, I'm gonna, I've got a bunch of guest speakers from all kinds of teams all across uh, North America going to be speaking tonight to help me out, show you guys how some of these things are done. Uh, next, next week, uh, we're going to go from the nervous system or the electrical part into the brain. So next, next session is going to be about the actual uh, control system and how to, how to get the, uh, the data set configured, how to program the uh, Roborito. If we can, how to set up CAN bus and, and, and to set up the device drivers, get them all talking to each other, and maybe even a, a few simple programs. It's a very, it's not a difficult thing for a rookie team just to get the basic robot running with a controller, you know, a, a joystick controller, a hand controller. To take that next step and make it autonomous, you know, is, is a very big step, and it's not that hard. There's lots of ways of doing that, so we're gonna we're gonna talk about that and get us closer to the kickoff. The kickoff is January 9th. 9th. Yeah, one week after the first leg of the league. <laughs> January 9th is a kickoff. We're gonna get a bunch of SAGE students to help us, actually the rookie teams, build a complete working robot control system and all, so we'll have them running around out in the cafeteria area. Uh, right after you guys find out what the competition is, so our goal is to have every rookie team have a basic platform that technically they could just take to the competition right away and it will bug it and bump into things, right? Um, which is good, half the battle is getting the robot up and running. So that's sort of the sequence. If you guys have anything you want to learn uh, that we're not covering, you know, it doesn't have to be just what I say we learn, it can be what you guys need to have. And if you want to have branch out sessions or other sessions, workshops and things like that running at the same time, we can do that too. Right? We can have, we got lots of room here for all kinds of stuff. So I thought today, before we get going, I'd just uh, introduce myself and, and, and reintroduce uh, all of you so we know who's at the, actually uh, at, the, at the thing today. Uh, a lot of the rookie teams know about the wiring, so it's not a really a big, a big uh, show here, but we'll just start with, my name's Craig Maynard, uh, again, I teach at SAIT, I've been here for 36 years now, and currently I'm teaching robotics and automation, and I'm the executive with the first robotics uh, FRC West, and I'm, I'm trying to get the first Lego League up and running too in the uh, in the Calgary area. So, who are you? <laughs> All right. So let me let me talk about my little blurb today. Uh, not so much for a tech challenge. Uh, this I, I'm really going to focus on first robotics competition stuff, of course. Uh, that doesn't mean first tech's not important. It's all the same principles, different platform. First Lego League is the same principles, different platform. Everything I see here, I see in Lego NXT and EV3 kits, all the same, right? This is just a little bit more, uh, a little bit more advanced, a little bit more education required. So, uh, if you can't see the screen over here, if you want to move over to the other side, that would be good. Uh, the control system was pretty good for its day, but it's evolved a lot since then. So today, what we want to talk about, I'm going to give you a little history of the FRC control systems, very brief. I want to talk about the modern FRC system and why it's so cool, what advancements they made in the system. Uh, it's cool enough that I mean, I'd like to use it for other robots too. I mean, I, I'd like to build a battle bot and use the FRC control system for it. And I think I've seen battle bots out there that actually have it. It's just a very capable system. Uh, we're going to look at the kit of parts and the elements that are going to come into it and how they, how they tie together. We're going to look at the tools you need to have to fabricate your kit of parts and to wire everything all together, get things set up. I'd like to talk about the wires and the cables, all this good stuff, and how you, and how, how you interconnect them, how you uh, put connectors on them, how you manage them, uh, what the different gauges mean, why you use one wire the size of your thumb and one wire the size of a thread at different points. How to lay out the control system, uh, some points and tips about uh, you know, laying out the control system on your panel and your robot itself, and then how to wire it all up when you're done. So that's sort of the, uh, the layout. If you guys have any directions you want to show me, just feel free. All right, this is your talk. So, how's that sound? Good? All right, let's get rolling. So, you get your kit of parts, 
uh, you get a whole bunch of pieces. Now back in the original days, this was what they had. It was an innovation first uh, FRC robot controller. This was the old one. It used a wireless, wireless radio system and, and serial data. It had the old Talon motor controllers and things like that. It had a transmitter. Which one was the transmitter? One, yeah, this was the one that hooked up to the laptop. This was the one that went in the robot, right? It was limited input output, limited control functionality, kind of slow, it's sort of buggy, right? But it did work really well. And it was based on, it was invented by uh, microchip technologies and LabVIEW, so it was sort of similar in those respects. But th that was the old original robot uh, control system. Then it was superseded by these guys. And if anybody here is older than two years in, in first, you might recognize the old Compact Reel. This is the old control system called the C Reel for National <coughs> Instruments. C Compact Robot IO. And it was, it was designed to be a programmable logic controller for National Instruments. And they repurposed it to be a controller for the first robotics. And a very fast controller, had some, a great operating system, uh, very fast electronics uh, using FPGAs and, and uh, CPLDs, complex programmable logic devices inside. But a little clunky as far as wiring it up. I mean, it had these, these funny connectors on with wires that you had to kind of handle yourself. It had, uh, it had this thing called the digital sidecar that had to be kind of cobbled in and worked with them. There was a lot of electrical problems, a lot of mechanical electromechanical issues that worked into it. Uh, it had the, so that was the brains, we had this power distribution board, it sort of worked, it worked pretty good, but it had some limitations. Uh, and we had, and then we had of course some motor controllers and, and some, this digital sidecar to uh, actually add IO onto that. And then there was this great big ugly parallel cable that went from here into there, caused no end grief. However, that FRC control system was uh, in use for a long time, right? Um, there was some <laughs> issues, but anyways, thank heavens, they learned, from, uh, they learned from the previous two systems and they brought us our brand new control system which was just introduced last year. And it's called the Robo Reel, right? Robo, of course, for robot, and Rio Robot IO. It's a repurposing of the same comp C Rio they had before. They repackaged it, they put it into a much tighter, smaller uh, interface. They upped the processor speed, they upped the memory, they upped the I.O. capacity on it. It's still got some glitches and weaknesses, but those are far overshadowed by the strengths that this particular system has. And this is the kind of stuff that you're going to find in your kit of parts. You're going to find uh, uh, fuses, a power distribution board. We're going to look at all these things kind of one at a time. Right? Um, this will be the second year, and they're getting more and more um, uh, Bug-free as, as the years go on. It's much better even this year than it was last year. You can program this thing in, in C++. You can program it in Java. You can program it in Python. Or you can program it in National Instruments' own famous uh, function block diagram language called uh, LabVIEW, which is very cool. And I kind of like LabVIEW, but personally. I, I mean, I do them all, but I like LabVIEW for us because you start with the first Lego League and they use the EV3 mindstorm software, that's a function log diagram using design by LabVIEW. And then you move on up to uh, the NXT, or the uh, first head challenge, again, an interface that looks that's good, invented by LabVIEW, it uses Androids and other uh, operating systems on top of that. And it, it varies right into using LabVIEW for the first robotics competition. It's just a little bit, well, very more graphically oriented. And it kind of appeals to your left brain rather than your right brain. Uh, but then again, if you're learning, learning Java or Python or C++ in your programming course at the school, use the structured text. That's good too. So that's our kit of parts. Okay, any questions about that? So what I'm going to do right now is uh, introduce you to the Robo Rio with uh, some friends of mine. This is, uh, this is the big release of the Robo Rio, and it's about eight minutes long. Uh, so I'm going to actually explain it. I'll just show you when they actually introduced the Robo Rio, but they're talking about national instruments and how it progressed from um, all the earlier uh, languages to, and, and hardware systems to where they are right now. Yeah. So I'm going to actually jump over to 8, and you can watch the whole thing if you want to download this quick presentation. We'll make it available to everybody. So here they are sort of bragging about the, 
this great new role where we go right about there. Very excited to introduce the new FRC controller for the 2015 season, based entirely on the Latin real architecture. Oops, sorry. What happened to my theme? The and we're gonna do this again. I can't touch anything else or it goes away. Uh, more powerful, but we also had to make it compatible with all of the software that's been created over the last few years. So this morning, I'm uh, very excited to introduce the new FRC controller for the 2015 season, based entirely on the Latin real architecture, the new NI Robo Rio. Now, uh, Chris was one of the project managers for the Robo Rio, so he's going to tell us all about it. Sure, right? When we set out to create a new controller for high school robotics, we wanted to lower the barrier of entry for rookie teams, while at the same time providing the capabilities that will empower innovation for years to come. In order to do this, we started with the laboratory of architecture and used the same Xilinx Zinc ARM Cortex A9 dual core processor and FPGA that's used in compact rear. This represents a 500% increase in performance over today's control system. We then wrap this core with a rich IS set, including a custom electronic support, which allows for students to design circuitry, which can be directly embedded into the controller to further extend its capabilities. And through feature reduction and integration, we've reduced the size by 50% and the weight by over 75%. And in order to survive in the demanding environments of robotics, Robot Rio is built for shock and vibration and features reinforced IO, short circuit, and over voltage protection located throughout. That was a huge now, problem with the CPU on the hardware. We've also improved the getting started experience with a focus on accelerating code development and deployment. And by keeping the same APIs and programming language support that we have today, Veteran students can use their expertise and start with the code that they already have. Now, one question that we get asked is when am I ever going to use this? Well, the lab degree of architecture is the same technology that engineers and scientists are using around the world, solving brand challenges today. That's right, Chris. I know they're really going to appreciate it, but you know, I think, I think you may have forgotten one of the, probably the most important step. No? Yeah, uh, and that is that uh, we are going to donate to first one controller for every FRC team. All right. Um, and I want to thank our wonderful suppliers that have come together and made such generous contributions that really help us be able to do this donation. I've got them up on the screen here, and they're in the theater today, so please. Yeah, thank you. Yes. Uh, there's, a, there's another session? That's right. So we know this is going to generate a lot of questions. And so I invite students that are here, as well as those that are online, to join us for a QA session of experts in the 2015 control system later this morning. And you can follow us on hashtag uh, Lobotica. Or Lobotica, sorry. Great. Thanks, Chris. All right. So there it is, that was from last year, and we are all excited, and you know what, it lived up to its name, it was a really great processor. Um, the old c Rio had issues, you had to, it was a metal case, which means you couldn't just screw it to a metal back plate, you had to screw it to an insulator like wood or plastic, which screwed up a lot of things. There was mechanical issues with all those connections, shaking loose with time, because they had these plug-in cards that could come off, they had these goofy wires coming off that could come off, a lot of failure. This thing a much tighter, tighter package, and much more, uh, much more effective control system for your robots. All right, so moving on. This is the Robo Rio itself. Uh, let me close this up. You can see it. You can see it in the system right in here. It's a nice size. Uh, as I said, much lighter and smaller, easier to attach, lower profile, filled with all kinds of input and output. All of these things there are, are 16 digital input output ports, general purpose digital I.O. ports, which could be used for uh, pulse width modulation or speed control or anything you want. 
It has an RS-232 port for interfacing to serial devices. If you have any serial peripheral devices using that, it has a, an industry standard a communications tech a path called I2C, I squared C. Uh, and it's, it's available. In addition to I2C, it has CAN bus, controller area network, which is a common controller area system I use in all our robotic systems here. They're all connected by CAN bus. So CAN bus is a common industrial control. You'll learn how to use this. You're halfway to uh, getting your automation diploma. Uh, power port. It has a USB port plugged right into it, and it can host USB, so it's got the, uh, the Type-A connectors and a couple of, of uh, USB hosts. Little package, it's got little, little divots right here that can be used for mounting the zip ties. It's got screws on the bottom for mounting it to, with screws and screwing into it. There are number six uh, screws plug in the bottom, and of course you can, you can attach it in a number of different ways. That's the Rover Rio. Okay. Uh, the other thing that you're going to get in your kit to interface, um, of course that's the main control system. The other thing to interface to the power parts of your, or, uh, your robot would be the power distribution board. Again, this is all brand new and redesigned for uh, first robotics this year. You've got, um, you can see the power distribution board on our, uh, on our system right here, all the fuses in place. You've got some high current 40 amp ports. Right over here, one, two, three, four, oops, go back. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, 12 volts, so you've got all of those things. You've got 20 amp and 30 amp ports over here for high current. Um, you've got a beautiful connection now for the battery to go into it. Last year's the connection was sort of exposed and had to be covered up and protected so it didn't short up. Very dangerous to have a short across uh, a lead acid battery. And it was sort of exposed. Now it's all sealed up in here. Beautiful, uh, a beautiful little integration there. It has a CAN bus, control area network now. So now the power distribution board can actually communicate back with the, with the robo reel. So as the motors are drawing current, uh, that and that current amount can be sent back to the robo reel, which can use which you can use to determine the load on the motors. So if you can see any excessive current or noise or spikes or any aberrations out there, the co this CAN bus will communicate that back to, the, back to your program itself. Um, you've got 12 volt out outlets over here. You've got a special 12 volt output for your Robo wheel to power it up. Um, and there's a the fuse for the Robo wheel. Um, nice clean package. And it's even a little smaller than last year's power distribution board. You can see it all right here, all, all hooked up, ready to go and status lights down at the bottom telling you it's, it's ready to rock and roll. This is an example of the power distribution board and how one team wired it up, so I thought maybe we'd have a look at that. Uh, you can see it's just put onto a wooden platform here, some zip ties, some screw-ons, but let's, uh, let's listen to the team as they describe it. The power distribution board. This year's power distribution panel has eight 23 amp ports and eight 40 amp ports. There are four fewer 23 amp ports because the digital sidecar and analog breakouts have been integrated into the robo reel and don't need to have separate power supplies. There are three 12 volt power supply ports at the bottom of the unit. The one on the right goes to the 10 amp fuse to the robo zero, the two on the left goes to the 20 amp fuse to the back control module and then the voltage regulator module. <coughs> is also a detachable plastic article to the battery terminal to prevent short circuiting. This is a CAN connection and terminated dump here. The PDP no longer includes the LED indicator lights that show the this fit. Okay, relatively easy to use. It looks great even on our, even on our rookies robot. Very clean layout. <coughs> Okay, another module they've created, which is sitting up here in our little demonstration board up here, is the pneumatics controller. They've actually got a special controller just for handling your air systems. Uh, the pneumatic controller has got a CAN bus interface, which means, again, you can control it through CAN bus. Uh, it's also got uh, solenoid channels for turning on and off just basic solenoids and relays. You've got uh, channels 4 through 7 here. You got channel zero through three, so this pneumatics controller can also turn on and off electromagnetic solenoids that can be used in your robot. Over here, uh, this is the output to the actual compressor itself. Now, these two pins right here, they claim, can actually 
go straight into your uh, compressor unit. All right, this is a this is the compressor unit here in your uh, in your kit of parts. This is the cable that goes into the compressor unit, and this is the appropriate size cable considering this compressor draws about 10 amps of current when it runs, or more, right? I'm just going to say it runs, it does about 10 amps of current and more when there's a load on it. So apparently, and everyone keeps telling me, you can plug these wires into those connections. I'm a little skeptical, but they say it can be done. These, these connectors look like they're a little small for that gauge of wire, but um, they say that's what it's meant for. I thought, I would have thought that that connector itself would have gone off to what's called a spike and operate a spike relay, and the spike relay controls this. But Max, did you, did, have you tried? This goes straight into that. Okay. It does, because that connector just, it seems too small for this cable wire. Yeah, no, no, no. All right, good. Well, there you have um, The uh, compressor comes right out of those two little connections in there, and the pressure switch, which monitors the, you know, the pressure of your system, goes right in there. We talked a little bit about that during our pneumatic stop. You've got a status control light here, you've got a nice 12 volt input to power it all up, and you've got the can bus. And we, we talked about that before. Beautiful little package, right? Beautiful little package, just sits right in there. Right? And wait, there's more. This is, a, this is a standard little Wago connector you're using now uh, to interface the wires, to, to clean up things. In the past, they had little, sometimes they had screw-in terminals, sometimes they had press-in, sometimes they had Phoenix connectors and stuff. This little Wago connector is super sweet. The wires push right into the hole, and to get them out, you push this little button down here and pop the wire out, so they've really improved uh, how you can connect all these things together, reducing the chances of wires breaking loose, and short circuits, and all that kind of ugly stuff. So we'll talk a little bit about how to use these connectors for in just a minute. This is what's called a voltage regulator. So what a voltage regulator does, and you can see it, you can see the size of it right here. That's the voltage regulator. It takes uh, 12 volts in from the power distribution board, and it smooths out that voltage and delivers it to peripheral devices like the cameras and whatever else needs to be hooked up. So you see there's a 12 volt 500 milliamp output right here, 12 volt 2 amp output here, a 5 volt 2 amp output over there, and a 5 volt half an amp 500 milliamp output over here. Now you gotta be careful, when it says 2 amps, that 2 amps means 2 amps total. You can have 1 amp here and 1 amp there, or half an amp there and 1 and a half amps there. You can't have 2 amps, 2 amps and 2 amps because this is supposed to be two amps total, okay? And then you've got the monitor lamps right here. So this is a very useful thing for stepping and stepping down voltages, regulating, smoothing out the voltages, and feeding them to things like your, or your modem, your radio set, and, and uh, cameras and things like that. So the voltage regulator, okay? Now, the coolest thing of all, they've also got some new motor controllers out there. And the motor controller is where it all comes down to when the rubber hits the road. You got a lot of current that can be provided by the power distribution board. That current has to make it into the motors. Uh, well, that's all done through the motor controllers. So you can see uh, there's a bunch of older legacy controllers like this Jaguar controller here, the Victor 888 uh, controller. The Talons are all compatible with, the, with this system. These guys. Uh, and this one here used pulse width modulation to control them. Uh, pulse width modulation is coming out the digital the PWM outputs of your rover wheel. And the way pulse width modulation works, it's a very, it's a very, very small wire. Look, well, could you turn the lights on there, brighten it up a little bit first? Pulse width modulation comes to a very smooth better way. That's it. Thank you. comes to very small wires like this. Uh, there's a plus 5 volts of ground, and the white wire is a signal. And the way the PWM works, in a nutshell, is uh, the signal that comes out is on and off at a certain duty cycle. This whole time from here to here is about 20 milliseconds, about 20 one-thousandths of a second from this point to that point. The width of this 
part of the signal determines how fast the motor is going. So when it's quite wide, the motor is going flat out. When it's hardly on at all, like this, the motor is on considerably less, right? So this is just a standard pulse width modulation. Hobbyists use this all the time for controlling servos and things like that. It's a bit of information. So this particular one would be a very fast operating motor, and this one would be a slowly operating motor, and you, it, you, know, you can change the width of that. And that's the little wire you use. So you have a big, big cable from the power distribution board that goes into your motor controller, and that is passed on to the motor by current under control of the pulse width modulation. Okay? So you can see here, um, maybe you can't. I'm going to roll this in over a little bit. It's okay. Sorry about that. Okay. Let me just put it on the, the screen here so I can show you. So, um, These two, these two controllers right here uh, have the bottom two. I mean, the bottom two have these white, black, and, and red wires coming out of them, and they're moving up to the top where they come into the uh, the pulse width modulation outputs on your rover wheel. And I've only got two of them that use PWM, so I'm just choosing channel zero and channel one, right? And then I must associate those channels in the software with my with, with these two motors. And if you look at the motor controller down here, you can see the business end of the motor controller is hooked right up to the, uh, the power distribution panel through these huge wires, through big fuses, 40 amp fuses here, and these should have 40 amp fuses in them. So the big current comes through here and comes out the green and white wires. And those green and white wires then travel down to our, our motors. And these, these motors are called SIMs, right? Very powerful, high current, um, efficient motors, right? So the, um, that's what the motor controllers do. So most motor controllers, the Talons and Jaguars and all those guys, use pulse width modulation for information. But nowadays, nowadays they also have the new Talons coming out, this Talon SRX, and this Talon SRX has got CAN bus. Right? Which means you simply take the, the, the CAN bus signal and daisy chain them all together so one connects to the other, connects to the other, just like Christmas lights, right? And then the last end of the CAN bus goes to the uh, CAN bus controller on the rover wheel. And then you set this up as a CAN bus device, you give it a number, number 1 through 99, or not 1 through 255, right? and um, and then you can address that device using the software just by its device number. Okay? So CAN is very sick, and the, and the new Talon SRX is, will do that. And this little controller blows my mind. It can do 100 amps at a surge, up to 30 volts, 100 amps, and continuous. I think it says, what, 60 or 70 amps of continuous duty? I think I actually was just uh, staring at it a little while ago here. Talon SRX, you look at it, 60 amps, 60 amps of current, uh, continuous, at up to 28 volts, and it can do in a surge 100 amps. So that is just amazing compared to what you could get five or 10 years ago. An, an old motor controller like that would be the size of a brick, right? And this thing is super cool, it runs super cold, you don't need any fans, you don't have to cool it down, like the old ones had to be, uh, they'll just run just like that. So they're great, great controllers. 60 amps is a ton of current, by the way, you guys. Um, and those are, the, those are some of the motor controllers you can do. All of the motor controllers that we used to use uh, with the older systems are still compatible with the newer systems, but you have these new controllers on there, 50, 60 bucks each. Really good prices. So those are your, those are your controllers. Any questions about motor controllers? So you have to program them based on what you need them for then, so it's yes. part of that programming. Okay. Yep, that's right. So uh, if you're using these guys, the Victors and Talons that have pulse width modulation cables, these little guys 
plugged into the PWM, then you would refer to the output PWM in your in your program. PWM zero, outlet one, outlet two. If you're using the CAN bus systems, then you would have to use it uh, by its device number, right? And you have to program the device number, by the way. They all default to device zero, which means when you first hook this thing all up, every CAN bus thing is device zero. And then when you go to talk to them, they say, for all device zero, and it, it just doesn't work for you. So I'll show you in the next class how to actually program your CAN bus devices to whatever number you want them to be. So okay. just the number of motors on um, your robot is there a maximum every year, or it depends on what the game is? Depends on the game. Okay. Uh, um, of course, first gives you a large number of motors on here. Uh, this is a, a sample of one of the gearhead motors. You always get a few sims, usually four of these big sim motors, which are generally used for drives. There's also small windshield wiper motors. Uh, there are devices that can either turn the motor on or off only, kind of a Boolean and binary operation, and there's other um, uh, drivers like these guys that can actually control the speed of the motors and direction. These can control the motors not only forward at any speed but reverse at any speed too. So they're bi-directional, high current, high efficiency motor controllers. But some motors just have to be turned on and off. Right? Sometimes you just have a motor that has to be turned on or turned off, like the like the motor in the compressor or the uh, of, of the uh, in the, in the, in the parts. A little compressor motor, but yeah, there's about a dozen motors. You get all different shapes and sizes. You are required to use the first robotics motors. You guys bring in your own motors, uh, and the safety inspector sees you're not using a first robotic motor. Your robots can't get the pass, right, Max? Right, and it's something they do sometimes. They'll try to sneak in their own motors. Well, you want to have an even playing field. You want to make sure the motors are safe. We don't know if you bring in a cheap motor with, you know, you know not not appropriate for the robot, you could cause fires, you could cause damage, and most of all, um, we just can't approve every motor that's out there, so we just give you these ones, a good selection, you work within those bounds. Okay, so that's motor controllers that are relatively simple to wire up. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. Now, some motors don't have to be operated at various speeds, they don't have to be reversed, they only have to be turned on or turned off, right? Like a, a solenoid, for instance, or, a, or a, a compressor motor, or a motor that maybe winds something up, but it only goes one direction and there's no speed control required. Then you use one of these little guys, it's called a spike, okay? A spike is a, basically is a relay, a relay contact. So the 12 volt battery goes into it, uh, you use a PWM controller to turn it on and off, but there's no speed control. It's just on or off. And then when it's on, all of the current from the battery goes out to your motor, your solenoid, or whatever the load is you're hooking up to. Okay? So this, uh, this is just a on-off controller. You can see right here, the spike itself, you've got a little LED to tell you it's operating or not. You've got a fuse on it in case you blow something out. 20 amp circuit breaker. Uh, you've got power and ground from the input and power and ground to the output, right? The, uh, these two have circuit breakers. The talons actually will go into overcurrent shutdown. They don't need circuit breakers. They will actually shut down if they're in any trouble. And then when you clear the short, they will start back up again. So that's kind of cool. Spikes. Any questions? You can stop at any time, right? How many spikes do you get in one kit? I don't know. Two? Two, four? It does change from year to year. So we're going to have to look at this year's kit of parts and find out what we can get. But I think at least two. Anybody remember? How many spikes you get on the kit of parts? We can look at the kit of parts and see. But I think you get a couple. And don't forget, you also get um, the ability to, to uh, you know, buy more spikes if you want. Uh, Andy Marks is the company that has everything. Right? So you go to andymarks.com and uh, buy whatever parts you want. Also, a lot of times Kit of Parts has a credit, right? A coupons you can use with Andy Marks to get free parts. So they won't give you everything. They will give you a few hundred dollars worth of coupons. Then you can take them to Andy Marks and pick all the stuff you want. Now that's that's a great idea. That's during the quick build. Is that? That's it, the, the quick build. Yeah. Yeah. So January 9th. The January 9th is quick build. Right. But I think the coupons work after that. You can buy whatever you want to, to fix right. up the robot. So it'll be in your kit, your uh, credits will be in your kit. 
Because not everybody needs all these parts. Some people need more parts. So, up to some. This is the robot stack light, uh, RSL. It's very simple to hook up. It's a little yellow flashing light. You just hook the A and B together. That's the positive side. And the negative side over here, the little screw in terminals. And they plug right into our um, right into our Rio. We've got a special slot for them. And that's right, right there. That's the robot stack light. Okay. Easy squeezy. It's an indicator light that has to be visible on your robot. So when the robot's actually running and it's in uh, autonomous mode, uh, the, the competitors know when it's in full operating mode that the, the, uh, the judges or the knows it indicates the status of your robot. And then when your robot shut down, the light shut down. So it says that your robot's ready to go. Okay. All right, robot we'll stack light. So now we got all these parts. Let's. Anybody got any questions about the individual pieces? Okay. Does it say anything about how to supply to these light sprites? Do you know what it is? I'm sorry, what's that? Does it say anything about how to supply to these light sprites? Yes. Yeah, any electrical components, uh, motor spikes, Jaguars, even the controller. I mean, a lot of us might, might like to put a PLC in there or an Arduino or something in it. If it ain't from first, if it's not part of the uh, first kit, they don't want you to use it. And it's just a safety thing. Yeah. Okay. And the other problem, too, is you use a lot of custom parts, and then you have a problem, and the control system analyst comes and looks at it and says, what the heck is that? And the guy says, oh, I put a Macintosh in there for my control system rather than the real system. You know? You can't help you. You're on your own. All right. Let's look at wiring up one of these guys. You got all the parts, you want to string them all together to make them work. So the first thing you gotta consider when you're gonna wire up the robot is what tools do you need to have in your tool belt to get the job done. And the rule about the tools is you get what you pay for, right? You get cheap tools, you get a cheap job done. It doesn't cost a lot to get good crimpers, good soldering irons, good, uh, good tools. So it's really useful for you guys to um, to invest a little bit extra to buy the right stuff. So here's a very cool uh, video on some tool selections. Hello. In this video, I will show you the tools needed to make a quality FRC robots electronic system. I'll add a link to each of these tools in the video's description. Here we have a low cost but high quality wire stripper. Your team will like to start off with one of these, and they're okay, but the price difference isn't that much. You can get one for like 12, 13, 14, 15 dollars, and these are like 10. Just pick up one of these to make your life so much easier. All you have to do is stick the wire in here, pull, and your wire stick. Very easy. Quality crimpers are another thing you should buy for your team. Most people have these crimpers where you just put the part in and squeeze just a thin, crowded piece of metal. You don't want to use these. These do not give you a consistent crimp. You can pick up one of these crimpers made for the terminals that go in Jaguar and all your other speed controllers and motor controllers um, for like 20 bucks. And it is very, very consistently makes strong connections. These three different crimpers are from three different applications. This one is for making PW wires. This one is for making powerful connectors. And this one is just for normal thermal. If you choose any tool, the most important one to get is a good screwdriver. This one is only like $5 from a hardware store. It comes with four different tips, so you have two different sizes of platinum, two different sizes of Phillips. Um, so you can flip that around and flip this around. It's a very simple, cheap tool, and it uses all the time. Precision screwdrivers are another very important tool. We use them all the time. This set comes with 
four flatbed screwdrivers and two Phillips screwdrivers. They have very small heads and I found them to be quite terrible. Flush cutters are an important tool. They're used for many things. Um, as the name suggests, it cuts things very flush to the end of the cutters. Um, you can see there's a flat part here. They're very useful for cutting zip ties and smaller wire. Very precisely. These are only like 10 bucks. Zip ties. Zip ties are very useful for repairing the robot on a pinch or for organizing your wires. You should always have some of these on hand. make sure everything's running well. The pit manager is one of the most important persons because half the time, if you haven't got everything under control, the poor guys working on the robots are spending looking for the screwdrivers, looking for the screws, looking for the hardware. The pit manager's gonna make sure he's got all that stuff handy, that you got the tapes handy, you got everything handy, the safety kit, the spill kit, everything that should go in a good pit should be watched by one guy. It's a huge job and it's, it's almost a, the kind of job you should assign to a person who just Trust him. So that's not it's not a bad bit of advice to talk about the pit manager. I don't know who that guy is. <laughs> All right. So now I want to talk to you guys about. I want to talk about the wires themselves. Um, you've got a whole selection of wires that are going to be available to you in your kit of parts. You get your kit of parts. You got big wires. Small wires, fat wires, skinny wires, stranded wires, solid wires, orange wires, green wires, you know, some with connectors, some not connected. Every one of these wires got a function, every one of them's got a purpose. But the most important thing about these wires is every one of them's got a gauge. Right? They all use what's called an American wire gauge. The American wire gauge, standard uh, convention, helps determine fundamentally how, how much copper you have in each one of these wires. So you can see here, this is a relatively uh, small wire. Now, the higher the gauge, the smaller the wire. So a 7 gauge or a 6 gauge wire, like this one. Get this thing open. Alright, that one that's open. This is the black one. This is the six gauge. You can see it handles a lot more current than one of these guys, which might be a 10 or a 12 gauge wire. Right? 
So how, what are gauges about and how do they work? The gauge is important to determine how much current the wire can handle. Not the voltage, it's the current. It's how the current is the rate of flow of electrons past a single point in the electric circuit, coulombs per second. Um, and the more current it can handle, the more power it can handle. So you can see here, uh, the gauges are inside this particular table. We've got 10 gauge, 18 gauge, um, and what you see in the, uh, the uh, major axis right here is how much current it can handle. So you can see that if you want to handle, say, 10, uh, 10 amps of current, you should have a wire that's about 18 gauge, as long as it's under 3 feet. Now, wires have internal resistance, so the longer the wire, the more resistance it has, the hotter it's going to get, so the less current it can handle. So if, you're, uh, if you want to do 10 amps, 18 gauge is good for 3 feet, Five, if it's 5 feet, you can do 18, but if you get down to 15 feet, you got to drop to a 16 gauge wire, a bigger wire, right? 14 gauge if it's 25 feet. So you can see that there's a direct relationship between the gauge of the wire, 200 amps to 10, a 10 gauge wire, down to 0 to 1 amp, 18 gauge is probably fine, right? So you have to be very careful to use the right gauge for the right applications. And as you guys are wiring up your um, you're real, you're gonna, you, it's, it's very clear in the instructions what gauge of wire you're actually supposed to use, so don't mix them up. Okay, you can't take something like the, uh, this 10 amp pump right here and put it through something like a 22 gauge wire. The wire will just get super hot, the insulation will burn, eventually you'll probably have short circuits and a, a big stink on your hands, right? And the pump probably won't work well because the resistance of the wire, being such a skinny little tube, uh, is going to really impede the voltage getting in here. You drop a lot of the voltage getting into the motor. So you've got to get the right gauge. Getting too big a gauge is a, you know, it would work fine with too big a gauge, but that's kind of a waste, right? Kind of a waste of, uh, of power. So anybody have any questions about wire gauges? There's about a million sites about American wire gauge and what it means. This next picture here, I've got some, uh, some shots of the different kinds of gauges here. You can see a very, very skinny 14 gauge wire, which in the short term can do about 20 amps. And there's a 12 gauge, and uh, this is stranded, stranded wire. This is a solid wire, solid cord. Uh, then we've got the 10 gauge, 8 gauge, 6 gauge, 2 gauge, and 1 or 0 gauge. And that thing's about the size of my thumb. It should have been something for scale there. Uh, this. Six gauge wire here is this guy. And you can actually see uh, on the cladding all kinds of information about the wire. Uh, it's SAE, Society of Automation Engineers. It's got a standard J1127. You can look that up. It tells you everything about it, what it can be used for, uh, everything about the insulation, everything about the environment it can work in. Uh, this thing can work up to 60 volts. Um, and it's six gauge. And it's specified to run. So it's been measured 105 degrees centigrade, dry, not meant to be used underground or in wet environments. So all the data is right there on the side of the wires. All right, so as you, as you wire up the robots, it should be quite clear what gauge you're supposed to use. Just look at the instructions very carefully. Now, you got these wires, you want to be able to crimp them? Yeah, all right. Absolutely. Now we'll put it up on the first website, we'll put it up on the highway link on the first web page, and I can send it to you. Absolutely. So here's a little uh, talk about how you actually crimp connectors onto the wires. Some wires you can actually push right into the holes, and they connect other wires, we have to put connectors onto them. Like this, All right, this connector, but you have to put them on. They don't come pre-installed. This year's power distribution panel has 823 amp ports and 840 amp ports. There are four fewer 23 amp ports between the digital sidecar and the analog breakouts have been integrated into the Robo Rio and Delhi's have separate power supplies. There are three 12 volt power supply ports and a lot of them. This is the the crimping of the wires.
I'm going to show you how to strip and clip a wire. That's the one thing to do. Is you just go look at the connector and see how much metal you're actually going to be crimping. You can look inside to see. On this particular one, it's this length right here. So that's how much you want to strip off. Then you get your wires. Hold them together very closely. Stick them in until both of them hit the piece here. Make sure that there's no extra pieces inside here. You can see this was inside and I dropped it out. Um, so just put the two wires, make sure both of them are touching the yellow plastic part, and then just pull. And it will give you two very nice strip ends. Next, you want to twist the ends to make sure there aren't any little tiny pieces of wire sticking out to the side. Now, that's a great wiring. Uh, after you do that, you would actually wash that off in alcohol, because that guy just put oils all over the wires by using his fingers on it. So just a quick wipe of alcohol to clean that off. I don't think you have to worry about that. We're not watching satellites. Now, to actually crimp our connector, we take the crimpers, put the part inside like this. Now, notice the, the uh, crimps are actually color coded. You'll see there's red, small crimps, blue, medium sized connectors, and yellow, large connectors. And as usually you have a thought on your crimping tool, which you can use that I'm going to find out. I'm going to show you how to just set up the part of the held in there. So you can see it's being held in like that. Let's take the wire and push it in just far enough so that it's flush with the other side. Wire to hold correctly. So, what you need to do is just put 
the wire so it doesn't even touch the yellow part. About that far. And then strip it. You can see we have a nice, just tiny bit stripped off. Now let's separate each wire a little bit. And twist them so they do not get messed up. Okay, now that those are done. Take your crimper and put the first connector into it. Now to actually crimp the wire, all we need to do is put the wire in here, make sure it's flat. Now if you look closely at the connector, you can see you're actually supposed to crimp part of the wire that you haven't stripped off. So you need to push it in a little bit further than normal. Time. You need to make sure that the wire this way is flat this way, so each of the wires is crimped the same way. Before you do each of your next ones, make sure there aren't any little striped wires. So now just put the wires in here like this. Takes a little bit of force to push it in. Just push each of the wires in like so. Occasionally there's a stutter on this. If you have to get that thing out, push on the white wire to relieve the screen and push down that tab with a small screwdriver or a scriber, paper clip, and then pull the wire up, right? So it shouldn't pop out. But you've got to push that little tab down. And same as the other connectors, just pull on the end. If it doesn't come out, your connection should be okay. First, the yellow dotted line is your controller area network, your CAN bus. 
Uh, the white one is Ethernet. So some things are connected together using uh, Cat5 Ethernet. The blue is pulse width modulation, which we talked about there a minute ago. That's the pulse width modulation cables. Uh, and then this one here would be just USB. So this is a great little layout. Uh, so you can see the robot signal line is hooked up with just ordinary DC voltage. Um, you can see the camera has got its own USB connector on it to provide it uh, the signal it needs. Your access point is also plugged in there too, so it goes into the USB or the uh, uh, this bridge right here. Ethernet cameras plugged in there, so this just leaves it all out beautifully. Um, this camera the camera has the USB connection, but the power for the camera comes from your voltage regulator up here. Uh, and then you can see your motors connected, the little dotted line represents the CAN bus and CAN bus daisy chains all of the CAN bus devices together. So you can see it, CAN bus, CAN bus, CAN bus, CAN bus, CAN bus. Just on one little, one little pair of wires, right? On 20 gauge, 20 gauge, 22 gauge wires. So I won't go into much detail about this. This is just a great reference when you guys are laying it out. If you have any questions afterwards, I can, I can certainly help you with that. But that's a lot to, a lot to gather, but it's all there. It's all there. So this uh, is a little video that talks about the uh, CREO and then talks about how to actually wire up the, uh, the systems. So let's have a look.
relay control, analog input, and PWM control ports are located around the perimeter of the device. In the center, an expansion port is also available to break out more pins and have provide them globally. We've created a few expansion ports for just this purpose. Links to our blog post about this project are in the description. Though please remember that the active board is not approved for use by preliminary rules for 2015. SPY, I2C, RS232, and CAN are also available. There's a new built-in accelerometer and LEDs along the side act as indicators. Input power is the same as it has been on the two pin serial connection. One major feature being introduced with the new control system is the use of the canvas throughout the main components. CAN is wired through these ports, color-coded green and yellow, on the components. The bus is started at the normal rio, passes through the PCM and other CAN-enabled components, and terminates at the PDP. The PDP contains a selectable terminating resistor. Additional items can be added throughout the CAN chain, but remember, if you add any components after the PDP, you will need to disable the terminating resistor on the PDP and provide your own at the end of the bus. And what you're saying is the CAN bus itself is a pair of wires that travel down the system. At the end of the CAN bus is a 100 ohm resistor, about 110 ohms actually, called a terminating resistor. There can only be one, right? Uh, and usually it's the last device in the chain that has a 100 ohm resistor. You don't have a 100 ohm in the middle or the, or the beginning of the chain. It has to be at the end. And there happens to be one in the power distribution board. So that one should always be the last part of your CAN bus. Right? If you have something further down the street, you have to disable the, the uh, terminating resistor in the beam coming up and then put your own terminating resistor on downstream. That makes sense, okay? Right. <laughs> something else that's new is the connection series. For placing many of the windows, we now have the Miller LSF connection. You just press down the white button with the flattish object. We use our white light tool. Push the wire into the opening. And release. We think these are generally easier to use, but there are a few things you need to watch out for. The connectors are very close together, like three and a half millimeters close. So when you're inserting the wire, it's important to do it cleanly and do everything in your power to prevent whiskers that could potentially cause shorts or other issues. One last thing to know about wiring is the space between PWM pins on the normal rear, in that there's a lot of them. We found that this spacing can cause problems like bent pins and loose cables, so we came up with a few solutions. First is just trying to tie the cables down tight. No guarantee that this won't bend the pins, but it does help with cables becoming unplugged. Or you can combine this method with a 3D printed cable magic that we will once again shamelessly promote. This is an insert for PWM ports that fills the gap between pins, keeping your PWMs in place and even keeping them organized. There are links for our original blog posts and the post with CAD files in the description. Feel free to print your own and let us know how this works for you. Okay, this here's a little more, another blurb about Canvas. Again, uh, CAN bus starts at the Robo Rio. It's the master. It goes to all of the devices. So you have a, a pair going in, and then a pair coming out of the next device, goes in, comes out of the next device, and ends up going to the final device, which has to have the 110 ohm terminating resistor. Now, uh, usually this wire here is actually twisted. There's a twist in the wire. And when you get it with a twist, keep that twist as much as possible, because that helps set up the impedance of that wire. Now, on this very short distance, it's not a big thing, but if it was a long can bus wire that went from my PLC to PLC to PLC across the room, the twist uh, has to be very carefully maintained, just like the twist in a uh, an Ethernet cable. Uh, so, there usually is a twist inside there, and you'll see that when you come up and have a look on here at the green and yellow can bus wire. Don't forget, um, you have to set a device number on each one of these guys through software. So uh, in the next class, I'll try to show you guys how to hook up, to hook up these devices and program the device number. Okay, now wiring 
cable management's the biggest here of all. Um, you can lay out your board any way you like. It's up to you. Obviously, it's based on the configuration of your robots and the metrics of the size of your space you have in your control system. So you can spread out your parts, you can put them together as much as you want to. But the wires themselves, you have to keep control of if you have loose, and sloppy, and they will pick only three ways to breakfast. It's a nightmare to troubleshoot. It's a nightmare to reposition things. Sometimes uh, I'll see situations where wires go over top of components and racing here and there, and it's sloppy. If, you, if you're going to design something, if you're going to learn something from uh, building a first control system, you should learn how to do it professionally and, and, and well. And uh, I can tell you, the, your own robot safety inspectors and the CSAs would appreciate a nicely laid out system rather than one where the wires are just running like an afterthought, right? Like a bowl of spaghetti. So there's lots of ways of managing your wires. Yeah, Max? I mean, they love if you label your wires on both ends. Yes. Get a paper out, a painter's tape, wrap it around, and label both ends what that wire is for. That's all part of management. Yep. Yep, he's right. And it's a good idea to do a schematic, your own schematic that describes how you're wiring it up and the cable labels. Here's an example of a beautiful board that was laid out. You can't even see the wires. The wires are inside these things called panel cable troughs. You can get these things from any, any electronic stores. Uh, we use them in industrial controls all the time. You look at the, the back walls and the side walls, all those great channels right there are holding all the wires. And they're all tucked inside here. So we have slots for the wires to go into and a beautiful cover so your systems can all be put in here. And then you see all the motor controllers, more motor controllers, PWM, or the pneumatics controller, the radio, the C radio, uh, mobile radio, and the power distribution board, and everything's going inside here. Okay, so that's one suggestion. See if you can get a hold of these Panduit uh, cable troughs. They come all sizes and shapes. The other thing, uh, another thing you can use to manage your cables, of course, is zip ties. You've got the zip ties. If you have zip ties, you might want to consider getting a bag of these little sticky tags, right? They're sticky on one side, you can place them on a clean surface and then run your zip tie through them to hold them down and make them all organized. So you can see on the FRC's uh, demo here, we've got the little sticky pads all over the place putting in. Now, in some cases, some of these sticky pads, I haven't used zip ties. I've actually used a black wire that I've twisted, right, to hold it in place. Well, the reason is, I mean, that used to be a zip tie, then I made some changes, I cut the zip tie, put a new one on, and then I made changes, I cut the zip tie, I put a new one on, I made changes, I cut, so I just said, to heck with it, and I put a little black wire, and I just twisted it, and then next, the next three changes I had to make, I just untwisted it, and put it in, and twisted it back up again. When it gets closer to the competition and the things stabilize, then they put the zip tie on, right? That's just a personal experience. So I'll pass around some of these little uh, sticky tabs. Another thing you can get from a company called Panduit is this uh, the spiral wire organizing tape. It, it opens right up, and you can wrap it around your cables, and it pulls them all together in one funnel, right? And this will stretch to many, many, many times its original size if you want to. And it keeps a lot of cables all neat and tidy and wrapped up in one spot. So if you can get some of this stuff in your, in your uh, hands, your hot little hands, it's also fantastic for managing your wires. Cable clamps. These are various sizes of cable clamps and they actually screw uh, right onto your work surface. If you're, if you've got a wooden board or a, uh, I don't know what you're going to use for your back plane. Uh, you can actually screw these things right on and they hold the wires nice and tight professionally. So you might want to consider getting some of these little cable clamps. For mounting components, oh, another thing you might want to think about too, especially for stuff that you're you know, putting on and off quite a bit, you can get um, this cable wrap right here, which is Velcro based, right? So around big cables and things like that, it'll, it'll wrap around your cables like that. One side's got the male side, one side's got, one, one side's got hooks, one side's got loops, and it makes a beautiful little connection like that, and it opens up quickly. You know? So you these, uh, these Velcro ties are great. Speaking of Velcro, uh, a lot of teams, when they're attaching their parts to their boards, like to have something a little more 
transitory, so they can make adjustments and switch things out quickly. Uh, some of them actually use this sticky uh, Velcro team. So you've got your hooks and loops on some very, very sticky surfaces that uh, actually hold on there. Yeah. Oh, a roll like that? 20 bucks. Yeah. And you can get it in different colors, different sizes. So this stuff here, for instance, it could stick on the back of your uh, Max board, Max module, and then the other side would go on your actual board, and it just plugs in and plugs out. So if you, if you're, if your uh, motive is to have parts that can be pulled off and put back on again, you can change it. Think about Velcro. That's sweet. Okay. <clears throat> I have so, a question. Yeah, beams. So. This panel here is plexiglass. This is plexiglass, yep. And some of the robots actually have wood that mm -hmm. they do, do uh, attach it to. Right. What's best? Is it can we do plexiglass or can you do you wood? Do plexiglass, but you risk it, it, it can fra fracture and, and crack. It's kind of pretty. Okay. Uh, plexiglass is a little harder to work with. I just did it because it looks good, and I had some plexiglass from an old equipment chassis that was kicking around before. I just cut it with a, uh, a jigsaw along here. I had to pre-drill all the holes and then a lot of the uh, connections in here, you know, the screw terminals, I pre-drill the holes and put the screws into them. If I let the screws thread, I'd probably end up cracking the plexiglass. But right? wouldn't it save on weight as well? But it does save on weight. It's nice and light. It looks good. You can backlight it. Sometimes sometimes like, you get that sexy factor by having some, some backlighting in it. Uh, if it's clear, you can see both sides, so it makes it more easy to, uh, you know, to check both sides of your, your system out. And this big particular one just slides in and out. It's just a little module. Just like the plexiglass, I put a build this little uh, nomadics uh, training thing on here. Right? And on the back, you can see I in some cases I just drilled holes and ran the zip, uh, zip ties through. Right? In other cases, I actually screwed bolts right through the hole right down. But you can use whatever you want. Recently, I mean, historically, you shouldn't use a conductor back thing. All right, we shouldn't use aluminum or metal or things like that uh, because, well, especially with the C Brio, the, the chassis of the C Brio was actually part of the ground plane of the C Brio and caused the system to burn out when it, when it was connected to the chassis and other things like the motors and the controllers are connected to the chassis. So they recommended to use an insulating back end, so plexiglass, wood, or uh, something like that would be well. Do you use a special tool that you were the plexiglass? No, I didn't. No, I just used it. But I did go through snow. If you go through too fast, it actually melts the plexiglass. It goes into it. It's going nice and slow. Putting, putting a piece of wood. Hmm? Putting pieces of wood around it before you draw the board. I never did that. I yeah, just like, sandwich it with wood, and it goes through the wood, yeah. into the board. Now. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. That was work too. Yeah. 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 Um, and as uh, an absolute, very important, and we do this all in all of our industrial control systems. We do a schematic diagram of all our control systems, and all our wires have numbers on them, and those numbers are actually labeled onto the uh, onto the wires themselves at both ends. So if you have a, uh, a digital I/O, you would have it labeled on your on your wire DIO one, and at the other end where it comes up DIO one, so you know where it came from and where it's going. Right? Uh, all your power cables, all your CAN bus cables, everything should have a label on it. And if you look at these stations behind you, you can see all those terminal locks, every black wire going into them. And the second row has got little white tags. Over there on my robot, on the robot on the cart, every, every wire going into every connection has got a little uh, tag. And they're actually uh, heat shrink tubes, specially printed. You can use those. Or you can get just wire tags uh, that you can write on or little sticky numbers you can attach on. But it's very important, very important to document your wiring so you can do quick troubleshooting if you have to. Okay? Anyways, that's sort of the that's sort of the once around for the, uh, the electrical control system on the on the uh, FRC kit. And it's pretty straightforward. If you wire neatly it's not too hard to tell if you're making mistakes. It's also pretty forgiving. Uh, you can you can make a few accidents in there don't encourage you to like reversing polarities here and there and more often than not they're they're protected inside so they won't burn out. 
I'm not, I'm not condoning that, but I think that uh, it's nice to know that if you do make a small mistake, uh, you, you have it, uh, you, you got at least one level of coverage, right? Okay, so that's about the end of my talk here. Uh, does anybody have any questions about the uh, about the wiring of the of the control systems? No. Uh, as I said before, uh, we're going to have a quick build on January 9th. Yeah, nice. January 9th, we're going to have a big kickoff party, big celebration. You're going to get your kit of parts, your twenty thousand bucks, fifteen thousand bucks worth of parts. And then if you, if you sign in to the quick build, uh, our students are going to help you put together actual robot chassis, the gears, the wheels, the, elect the basic electrical system, and we're going to program it up for you so you can run it with a remote control, a, a, a joystick control. I have a question for you and for Max. Um, when it comes to the battery backup or how many batteries should you have on a robot? Um, what kind of charger should you have on it? Um, All that stuff. At least two, what suggest? At least two batteries, and the charger comes with the, uh, the kit, kit parts. Which takes four hours to charge. It takes four hours, yeah. So it's and probably it's best. 20 minutes to discharge. Right. So say, uh, it's going to be very competition. They want a freshly charged battery for every day you're in. Mm -hmm. So I would uh, probably at least four batteries. Uh, and you have to buy a charger from what's the best place? Because you have four hours. Okay. So any yeah. common so store. This is a sealed lead acid battery. Gel cell sealed lead acid. So make sure that it's a sealed lead acid charger you got, right? The gel cell chargers and sealed lead acid are a bit different. Oh, by the way, here's that little spiral uh, wrap on the, on the cables you can see, kind of controlling those guys. Okay, so that's all. I'm just going to turn it.